Oatmeal stout might sound like a drink best consumed with a spoon, but it's actually a light, easy drinking stout suitable for sipping on a hot day. I'm going to attempt to brew one, then carbonate the beer and perform a fully closed transfer of it without any assistance from my CO2 tank. I'm Martin Keane, taking the homebrew challenge to brew 99 beers in 99 weeks. If I had to come up with one descriptor for a good oatmeal stout, that would be smooth. This is a beer that should be roasty and grainy without any trace of coffee, but very easy drinking. Now we're gonna build a beer here that is an original gravity of 1056. That will give us 5.3% ABV. And this is an English stout. So English stout recipe rules apply here. We're gonna use a lot of English grains, roasted barley, that sort of thing. So for the base malt, 64% of the grist is Maris Otter. Then, it will probably come as no surprise that the next ingredient in an oatmeal stout is oats. I'm using flaked oats and these will contribute to both the grainy taste of the beer but also to that smooth mouthfeel. So I'm going to use 14% flaked oats. Now in addition to that, I have 9% pale chocolate malt and 9% crystal 45 and then 4% roasted barley. Mashing at 152 Fahrenheit or 67 Celsius. All right, I've been putting this off, but it's time to say goodbye to an old friend. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie, daughter had fun on Yagi, her brain fried. My lady papa Zenny had a lady. Thanks, SpongeBob. Hello, Scooby Doo. Yeah, keep on heading if you want. I drive it like a nut. I don't want Now I'm using Fuggle Hops for this beer both as the bittering hop and the flavor and aroma hop. So at the start of the boil, I'm going to add in enough Fuggle hops to get to 25 IBU. So if you're brewing a five gallon batch, that will be one and a half ounces of Fuggle hops. And then 10 minutes from the end, I'm gonna add another charge of Fuggle hops. Uh, that will contribute about three IBU. And that in a five gallon batch is going to be a half ounce. Now I've really come to like these firm zillas, specifically this one, the firm zilla all rounder, because it allows me to perform a closed transfer from the fermenter into the keg without exposing the beer to any oxygen. And I was chatting with my buddy Brian over at Short Circuited Brewers about this, and he also has the same setup. And he's put together for me a cool little tutorial to illustrate exactly how to do it. So Brian, over to you. Thanks, Martin. If you wanna preserve the flavor and integrity of your beer, one of the things you wanna avoid is oxygen exposure. One of the effects of that is you can have your beer turn out tasting like cardboard or it darkens in color. And so what I'm gonna show you today is a closed loop transfer, which means that I'm gonna transfer from the Firmzilla all rounder down into a keg and then fill the space that's in the all-rounder with the CO2 that is in the keg. And what we'll be using for the transfer is going to be the Kegland five millimeter ID EVA barrier hose, along with four duo type fittings and four MFL ball lock fittings, two liquid and two gas. 
To prepare for the transfer, I wanted to make sure that the oxygen was completely purged from the keg. So I filled it with a mild solution of star sand and water, and I filled it all the way to the top until it was overflowing. You'll have to do that with some of the foam coming out of the top. You can't really see where the water level is until it gets to the top. So after I did that, I put the lid on the keg and then hooked up my CO2 tank and purged any headspace with, of any oxygen and all that might have been in there. After that, I took off one of the fittings of the jumper hoses and actually used it to drain the keg. And I swapped hoses midway through to make sure that both of them were sanitized. I purged both of the transfer lines by hooking them up to the keg that was pressurized with CO2 and then reinstalled the sanitized ball lock fittings. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hook up the liquid side of the jumper hose to the liquid side of the all-rounder. Go ahead and hook that up. And I've got the all-rounder pressurized with about 12 PSI and the keg is pressurized to about the same. And you can kind of see that some of the liquid is already in there. So I'm actually gonna put this on the liquid outpost of the keg and snap that on. And as you see, there was a little bit of transfer there, but the pressure will equalize pretty quickly in both of the vessels. So what we're gonna to wanna to do is we're actually going to wanna to purge a little bit of the CO2 pressure in the keg. And that will actually start our transfer going. And then once we do that, once we know the transfer is started, I'm gonna snap on the CO2 line fitting and then connect it to the in on the all-rounder. Now what will happen is as the beer fills the keg, it will push out the CO2 and the CO2 will actually fill this space in the all-rounder. Thanks, Brian. Now, he has an extra tip for me to enable me to perform a closed transfer without any assistance from CO2 from this guy. And I'm gonna show you how to do that, but we need to get some beer in here first. Leave my thoughts on the table. Set my keys by the door. All these fortune and fate. Beer has come in at 10.52. I am adding white yeast, 10.99. That's whipped red ale yeast to the beer. Okay, let's talk about this cool little tip for closed transfers. So Brian, back over to you. So here's what we're gonna do. With an all-rounder, it is a pressurized fermentation vessel. So what we can do is we can actually put the gas line or gas fitting on our EVA barrier hose with the dual type fitting. And then on the other end, put the liquid ball lock. And then depending on whether you're doing pressure fermentation or if you're doing just a regular standard fermentation, if you're doing a pressurized fermentation like I've done, you would want a spunding valve and you put that on the gas side of your keg. And then as your fermentation occurs, you're gonna be pushing CO2 through the line to the bottom of the dip tube, and that's important because CO2 is actually heavier than oxygen. So as your fermentation occurs, it's gonna push CO2 into the keg, and then it's gonna fill from the bottom up, forcing out any oxygen. Now, if you're not doing a pressure fermentation, you just wanna use this like, like that without doing a pressure fermentation or a spunding valve, you could just simply crack the pressure relief valve on the keg and let it fill up and basically use your keg as an airlock. Back to you, Martin. So I really like this suggestion and here's what I've done. I have hooked up the gas out from the Firmzilla to the liquid in of my keg. And then on my keg, I've added a spunding valve. Now I'm not gonna ferment this beer under pressure per se. So what I've done is I've set the spunding valve to five PSI, which means if we get above five PSI, the gas is just gonna come out of here. So the beer is not really gonna be under any significant pressure during fermentation. That is until fermentation is nearly complete. And what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna bump up this spunding valve to 15 PSI. So we'll get 15 PSI of pressure built in the fermenter and in the keg. And the advantage of that is it will force carbonate my beer. So that will save me doing it myself later with my CO2 tank. Then when fermentation is complete, I should be left with a keg full of CO2, ready for a close transfer, and a fermenter full of already fizzy beer. So it is now time to taste the oatmeal no, stout. No, 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 no. Wait, what? No, no. Oh, bye. Bye. 
see you on the next milk review. Well, Lauren, welcome to this with your lovely new haircut. Thanks. <laughs> now, the uh, the process actually worked brilliantly. The the whole transferring in kegs thing, and it, it, it made itself fizzy, so I didn't have to do any forced carbonation. Uh, so let's take a look at what you think of this oatmeal stout in terms of its appearance. They're always so dark. Yeah. Yeah, it's a dark stout, so... Like, yeah, really dark. Okay, so let's see if we get anything on the nose. Smell-wise, it does smell quite smooth. Um, I want to say... Are there some caramel under notes in this? Yeah, possibly. That's what I smell. It smells right. like it's going to be kind of sweet, but sweet. Well, let's give it a go. Okay. So is this the beer you drink for breakfast? Um, maybe. I definitely have to say, like, after all these dark beers we've been doing, like, I'm getting a taste for them, and I'm actually, like, learning. This one has, yeah, it definitely it tastes a little bit like caramel. With the sort of the flaked ingredients here, this should add to sort of quite a, a creamy mouthful, even though it's not a, a nitro-served beer. Tastes like chocolate. Tastes a little bit like chocolate, yeah. a little yeah. bit like dark chocolate. So I'm definitely getting a bit of the, the chocolate sort of characteristic as well. I would say a little bit more milk chocolate than dark chocolate for me. Everything you need for this beer is in the video description below. We are sticking with stouts next week with a stout that I don't think either of us has ever tried. Hmm.